Jens Robertson, um, who was presented here before. Uh, Jens is a uh, retired Air Force officer who was involved with missiles and space flight. So, of course, uh, his interest is in World War I aviation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> his uh, last assignment was at Maxwell Air Force Base, and during that assignment, he was able to dig into the archives there. And um, one of his finds was a box of uh, photographs of the bombing of the Ost Friesland, uh, which hadn't been looked at in many, many, many years. So I'm going to let him tell you about that. So, Jens Robertson. Chris, thank you. So, uh, being a, uh, an Air Force officer, of course, I you know, come from a, from a uh, place where Billy Mitchell is, of course, reported to be a hero. Um, but uh, doing a little research on him, uh, I find he's a, he's a controversial hero, and it kind of depends on which uniform you wear. Uh, in researching these photos, I, I went for a, 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 a different viewpoint, so I found this book... Um, written by the Navy perspective, and of course here he's a villain <laughs> uh, versus a hero, uh, but it, it was interesting to me to see the, the different perspective the Navy has and uh, how they view the same activities and the lens they view the, the history through. Um, so, as Chris was saying, I, wanted, I, I had a backstage pass to uh, the Air Force Historical Research Agency could wander around, open any of the archival boxes and have a look inside. and. I saw a box that hadn't been looked at or checked out in decades, so I cracked it open and found this folder full of all these photos, and when I realized what they were, it's like, well, I haven't seen these before, and digging a little more into it, I found this is a lot more complex operation than just flying out and dropping a few bombs in one battleship. So, um, there is a lot going on in early 1920, at the end of the war, uh, Billy Mitchell comes home in January of 1919, he gets put to work on, uh, well, he finds his own work on trying to figure out a mission for these, uh, the Air Force uh, that he built in World War I, and there is a debate going on in the country after seeing the effects in World War I on the uh, role of who should be responsible for the coastal defense of the United States, uh, should it be Army Coastal Artillery uh, uh, Battalions, or should it be the Navy intercepting out further at sea? Billy Mitchell saw this as a perfect opportunity for the Air Force to intercept even further out than the Navy, and made the pitch that uh, it was going to be cheaper and more effective than the Navy uh, or the Army forts. And so, of course, he made enemies on both sides immediately. In uh, early 1921, there's a series of congressional hearings where the Navy is are articulating out this plan that they'll do because they don't think that a ship can actually be severely damaged by aerial bombardment because of the low accuracy of the aircraft. And Billy Mitchell, uh, you know, prominently goes in there. And by the way, he also released what we would call today classified information, uh, which I'll cover in just a second here. But the, the um, Navy had done some secret tests on one of their old battleships to see how it worked if they placed bombs on the deck of the ship or in the water next to the ship to see the impact. And while the Navy says it could have made way underwater and couldn't have continued its mission, it was graphically uh, and, and luridly you know, damaged uh, in, in very uh, visible ways, very horrendous ways. Um, and so Billy Mitchell got a copy of those photographs and immediately released them to the press right before he testifies, talking about how aerial bombs can do this kind of damage. Now, again, the Navy had simply set the bomb on the deck and set it off, so it's not like a plane flew over and dropped it. That nuance was lost on reporters, and um, so they, he got, uh, Bill Mitchell got great press when he was talking about how we can sink a battleship, and the Navy says, no, there is no way you can sink a battleship. Challenge accepted. Thank you. You just set the parameters. All I have to do now is sink a battleship. I don't have to do all this other testing that you want to do. I have one mission. And uh, so he was willing to fight dirty to do so. The... Uh, Timeline I have, this is the timeline just of the photographs. There's a lot more going on here than uh, I was able to, uh, that were then were, were photographed in this folder. Uh, particularly the, uh, the Indiana was with the one that Secret Navy test in the fall of 1920. Uh, between October 12th and November 4th, there's a series of uh, bombing missions. First, it's the Navy flying uh, planes over, just dropping little sand bombs of 25 to 50 pounds to see if they can actually hit the ship to begin with. And then they, uh, they started <coughs> detonating bombs in the water next to it and then bombs on the deck. Um, after they started sending off bombs about 25 yards or so off the, 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 uh, the, sh the, sh the ship's uh, port side, I believe, they ruptured the hull from the shockwave and they had to tow it to shallow water to keep it from sinking. And it became just sort of a hulk there sitting in the 10 feet of water. 
Um, <coughs> Billy Mitchell has those conversations with Congress and gets the, the bombing mission of the Ostfriesland set up in January. In March of that year, March and April of that year, he, the Navy complains to the Chief of Staff of the, of the uh, Air Service that Mitchell is uh, flying over this Indiana Hulk and bombing it uh, for practice without permission. So uh, he, he was basically saying, it's a Hulk, why do I need permission to bomb it? But apparently he got uh, told to stop. And so you start to see them then do additional different kinds of practice uh, in the period around May, uh, getting his crews trained on how to hit ships at sea, uh, because this is one thing that hadn't been done in World War I. So this is an unknown area where uh, we don't really know if it can be done, but he has asserted it will be done, and now we'll find out what actually happens. Um, this is the, uh, the Indiana. It was uh, laid down in the late 1800s, and it was uh, in beautiful shape in 1908. Um, after the bombing tests in 1920, it was not in such good shape. Um, and again, sitting on a sandbar, the, I believe it's the Texas is the uh, wreck in the distance behind it there on the bottom photo. That was another one that was uh, used for bombing practice, I think for shore artillery. And here are some of those photos uh, that we started uh, coming across. So the... Uh, Army, not only did they have the aircraft that Billy Mitchell's uh, team uh, flew, they also had a series of uh, dirigibles or uh, blimps up there acting as uh, platforms to record and film the uh, events of the bombing thing as part of the data collection process. Uh, here's uh, uh, the Bombay of the, the Martin Bomber II, also known as the, uh, the Night Bomber <coughs> short, short Range, the MBS-1. These uh, planes had only started to come online in September of 1920, so they're still very new planes, and uh, they can hold a larger payload than you could see during uh, World War I proper. And we start to see some of these, uh, they lay the planes out and uh, do the review and inspections before uh, they do the missions. This is a view, I think, um, to the northeast. I'm probably a little bit disoriented in how Langley is laid out. But you can see the, uh, the, the blimp hanger there in the background as the, sh as the planes are laid out on the field. And we have, um, here is one of their practice bombing ranges, and you really can't sit here until you do the next thing, which is to show where the ship outlines actually were previously. You can see the, the, the uh, very simple uh, late canvas on the ground and see if you can hit it uh, in, the, in the white shreds that are still there visible on the ground. Um, here they are loading bombs, 100-pound bombs into the MB-2 bay, and then you can see the, uh, here's they're laying out the next round of uh, ship outlines for the, uh, the SE-5s to practice as well. Uh, the other thing I'd point out is, well, the area where the target is, is is pretty well obliterated. You can also see all the misses in the area outside of that. Um, and for for the its accuracy of the day, and I won't bore you with all the statistics of exactly how many bombs and everything like that, but basically you got about, yeah, on a good day, you could get about 10% of your bombs on target, and you could get 40% within about you know, 75 to 100 yards where they could have some possibility of effect of causing a shockwave to be transmitted below the waterline uh, of varying degrees of effectiveness. Uh, here we are, June 11th, you can start to see the, uh, the, the uh, blimps heading out there as one of the uh, passing reviews is going on. Uh, here's a, a couple of their um, smaller aircraft. I just was impressed with the quality of this, these 8x10 prints. You can see the, uh, the numbers on the aircraft even from, you know, zooming in on it. And then here, uh, another view, you can see the blimp hanger on the lower side here, and then you've got the planes flying uh, both, both directions. The uh, arrow on the ground there is actually showing the wind direction for the day. It's a circle uh, painted on the ground in chalk, and then the arrow is directed in an uh, encompass direction. Uh, I thought this was a nice overhead view. The 50 aircraft on the field here on June 18th. You have a Caproni on the far left, uh, one of the, uh, the Hadley Page uh, 400s there next to it. And then you have the Martin MB2s ahead of those. You have the DH4s, and then coming around the side here, you have the SE5s starting to form up. We've got some at the bottom as well. Uh, give you sort of a different view of it here. Here's a view uh, from the edge of Langley. Uh, you can see the, the main uh, part of the base there where the, the arc uh, roads are. I thought this view was interesting, and then when I looked on Google Earth to take a look at it, I thought what was really interesting is this is the, the, the field that they're all lining up the aircraft on to get ready to launch and, and uh, do one of the bombing missions. Um, it's also where the F-22 is parked today. <laughs> so I, I thought that was a really, really resonance of history there. A hundred years later, and that same ground is being used by the same kind of uh, you know, bombing aircraft. Of course, the other areas have built up since then. Um, so the first uh, one up on the, on the, uh, the 
the uh, board here is a U-117. Um, again, can you tell if you're sinking a, a, a U-boat or is it just submerging? Um, you can see they've got two target markings on the fore and aft deck there for, for orientation and for scoring purposes. The, the game plan for all these uh, ships, of course, they were, they were unmanned, um, but they also would have a series of bombing attacks both by naval aircraft and by uh, army aircraft alternating in differing uh, weights of bombs being used. And in between those um, bombing attacks, there was a hold times called in there where the, uh, they would send out uh, uh, small boats full of observers to come out and document the damage to the, to the ship uh, between those bombing runs and sort of document the progressive amounts of damage being done. Uh, at least that was the plan. Um, there, there were a couple things that worked against that on there, one, one being weather effects and the other being Billy Mitchell's impatience. Um, and to make sure that it was the Army bombers that eventually sank the Ostfriesland, so he sort of threw that uh, timeline away. There was a ship that we called the Henderson that had uh, an all-clear or not all-clear sign that we put out on the deck for the, for the planes to know whether or not they could bomb or if there were people still on board the, the uh, target uh, ship. Um, I believe they followed those rules, but only barely. They had to rush, and you'll see there's a later slide. They had to rush to get the, the observers off the ship because the bombers were coming in. Um, here are some of the Navy... Uh, uh, planes coming in on, and they're lining up. I believe that's the Henderson or one of the other ships in the flotilla uh, lining up to get their, their first bombing run here. And uh, oh, sorry, we, we'll jump around a bit. I put these in chronological order, so they're not exactly thematically in order. Here's the uh, the couple of the heavy bombs on, on the Martin. I do love the very classy and uh, high tech uh, cribbing they have underneath the bombs uh, to keep them in place while they're loading them. The, the, the two by fours and the stack of things there. Um, and here you can see another with a stack of, uh, of lumber holding that door, at least supporting that 2,000 pound bomb as the plane is getting ready to take off from the field. So, uh, again, I think we've improved our ground handling uh, by munitions since then. Uh, possibly there were some lessons learned. Um, so, here's, here's a, 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 a formation of, of DH 4s coming in on, on one of the attacks on the ships. Uh, there, there was a couple other ships that I don't have photographs of that were uh, bombed in this period. I don't have a full list of them all. Uh, this book covers in great detail every painful ship that was attacked, um, and, and whether rightfully or wrongfully. So this is the, the German destroyer, the G-102, being bombed in July on the 13th. You can see one of the, uh, I think it's an MB-4, or sorry, M Martin Bomber 2 there in the, in the field with it, which is... Again, these, some of these things look like they were filmed in Hollywood because you get these cinematic shots that you wouldn't normally think, but these are shot from the blimps. So uh, beautiful viewpoints of the, uh, the activity. There's the, uh, the German destroyer. As you can see, it's a little bit low in the water. Uh, we have made a few hits there. I, and I, there's about 150 photos in this collection. I've got about 50 in the brief here, so only the top third. There's a lot of misses I didn't put into the brief. <laughs> uh, but if you want... Now, this is one of my favorite photos because I like this, this is the Hollywood shot here. I've got I've got sailors uh, watching from the, in the foreground. I've got a, I've got a seaplane in the middle, and you can see these other ships in the background. And I believe that might be the G one hundred two there, the wreckage of it as it's starting to submerge as they're coming in on it. You got blimps in the air. The only thing I'm missing is the actual Martin bombers in this particular scene. Now, I don't know who any of these gentlemen are. So, folks in the audience that have. Uh, better facial recognition than I. These are the ones that, these are the Army pilots that sunk the Frankfurt. And then the next shot I've got are the Navy pilots that also participated in that same campaign. And I've got these available in JPEG, so you're welcome to them if you can identify any of the folks yeah. in them. What is the Navy aircraft? Pardon, the, the aircraft behind them? Yeah. I'm not exactly sure. It's one of the ones that would launch off the, off the rail off the back of the ship. Um, here, there's the Frankfurt. It's got markings uh, about every uh, I think 10 yards or whatever down, down its, its hull. Uh, you've got the blimp in the background there. Again, I thought another beautiful Hollywood shot. Here's the same shot from another blimp, uh, taking a picture of it. And you can see, that, again, those vertical white lines giving an idea of where the, you know, so it can mark where the bombs are actually hitting. You see there's those, just like on the, uh, the U-boat, there's the circles on the deck uh, fore and aft. <coughs> Um, and, and again, some of these just shots were awesome. This is the, uh, the, the uh, I think they're PN9 uh, Navy uh, seaplanes flying overhead. And when you zoom in on them, oh, this was a, is that one? yeah, here we go. So no, there's another one, and you can, oh, I missed the plane, sorry. One of, one of these has a picture of the, you can zoom in on these guys. You can actually see the pilot and the observer in the front of these cockpits looking over the side trying to uh, see how the bombs did. 
Uh, here's a couple of misses on the Frankfurt. Very close, but uh, misses nonetheless. Uh, we did get a few hits on it, and it didn't take many hits. This is a 300-pound bomb by one of the Army aircraft, um, and there's another bomb hitting another 300-pounder. Um, and then you can start to see that was a miss. The Martin bomber, I believe, is right in that frame there. But you can see the other ships in the background. This was a relatively large effort uh, to record all this activity. You can see here all the uh, the aircraft. Sorry, the aircraft are coming in on an early run here, and you got the ships in the in the uh, foreground. So. Very big effort overall, very big joint operation for the day. Um, this shot has made it into books, but I, I was really impressed with the, with the quality of it. Um, so this is at the, the base of a Martin MB-2 bomber. You've got a bunch of folks talking. I, I've got identification on three of them. That's General Pershing. There's Billy Mitchell explaining something to him, and then there's Secretary of War Weeks. I don't know who the other people are. What I'd really be curious about is, what is that mechanic on the engine hearing as he's working on the en on the uh, engine? What is the conversation going on below him? I'd, I'd love to hear what, what uh, his his thoughts were on that. And then here's the, the layout of the Ostfriesland. Uh, there it is uh, from the air. And and here come the Martin bombers coming in. This is the, uh, carrying 15,300 pounds of bombs on on, on on this particular run. Beautiful formation. <coughs> Uh, there's another close up with the two 1,100-pound bombs on it. And here's a hit. You can see all those little tiny uh, splashes. That's the debris being blown into the water and splashing as it hits. And here's a, this is a, a miss right next to it. You can still see some of those splashes from the earlier uh, probably 1,100-pound bomb that had just hit. Um, this is a crew, you can see the ship on the, the small boat on the side, that's the, uh, the inspection party going on board to uh, inspect the damage after the, the first round of uh, strikes. Um, and then this is the shot uh, afterwards. Uh, the, uh, this, the ship at the Ospreys, and I remember in January the Navy said you can't sink a battleship. In July on the 21st, the Air Force showed they could do that, or the Air, Air Service, showed they could do that in 22 minutes. Um, and the, uh, all the shots of the Das Friesland uh, sinking, it basically starts to take on water, lifts to the side, flips upside down, and then uh, sinks below the waves, um, all within clear view of all the senior members of the, the Navy and the uh, defense establishment on the nearby ships. Um, so uh, a bit of an uh, egg on the face of the Navy there. The, uh, the Navy <coughs> made uh, lots of excuses after the sinking, uh, that it wasn't under battle conditions, that you didn't have damage parties aboard the ship that could have prevented some of that damage from escalating and could have stopped the water. And, and all these excuses they came up with, and it wasn't just Billy Mitchell going, yeah, but he did sink it, and you said he couldn't. So they had another uh, set of tests in September that year with the Alabama. Uh, a little bit more uh, uh, difficult conditions. They tried a couple other different things. Uh, they used uh, phosphorus bombs, white phosphorus bombs. I guess one of the arguments within the Navy said, well, we didn't have anti-aircraft um, firing at you, which made you stop your bombing run. And Bill Mitchell said, well, I'll just drop uh, Willie Pete on you, and then your firing crews won't be there anymore. Uh, in fact, the, the one picture, which is the cover of the book here, which is the most famous shot of the Os Friesland, if you Google it, this is the image that comes up. That's actually the Alabama being hit with the, uh, the white phosphorus bombs. So it's not actually the Os Friesland. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they also tried, uh, they would, they also, they, the air service also dropped smoke bombs into the water to uh, create a fog to prevent the, the ship from uh, being able to see the planes coming in on it to test that option. Of course, again, the ship is anchored, so it's not maneuvering. It could have potentially maneuvered out of those. These are all arguments that they're now trying to get around the back end of the uh, discussion of, well, you, we said you couldn't sink a ship and you did. So we're now trying to make it as, as, as many excuses as possible. Um, there's the Alabama taking two 1,100-pound demolition bombs. Uh, here's some of the damage uh, that was done. Um, those inspection crews went out and, and viewed. Uh, that's one photo there, the right, below, right above the water line. Uh, here you can see through the deck, uh, through a couple of the decks actually, as you're looking at it, forward on the ship. And then we have uh, the lovely view of the, the front set of deck guns. The, I think, the, if I recall correctly, the right gun is actually below water at this time. Um, again, the Navy was trying to explain that they could have recovered this and, and brought it to shore. Um, I think it would have been a nice reef at that point. Uh, yeah, there's the bow of the ship. 
Um, again, the nice thing is you now have an elevated bow, so you can see uh, further from it, but that was not really an advantage. Um, from a seaworthy perspective, perhaps. Um, and I have another shot of the, uh, the, 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 parade, the parade grounds there in Langley, and then I think I've got one more here of, oh, okay, one at the end. So, end results of all the series of tests. Um, one thing I found interesting uh, uh, the, the other day was that uh, as I was finishing this up, I said, well, I've got to give some examples, or uh, what was the impact? One I didn't expect to find, I typed in coastal defense ships and found out that no country started, or no country laid down any keels or dedicated any ships to coastal defense after 1920. So, you know, up to 1920, they've been putting, you know, from 1860 to 1920, coastal defense ships keeping our country safe. After this had occurred in 1921, nobody does that anymore. So even if our Navy didn't agree with it, it looks like the other countries took the test seriously and said, I, I think we see a problem here. Um, Billy Mitchell's court martialed in 1925 because, uh, Said, you know, once a pirate, always a pirate, and can't keep his mouth shut, and uh, starts saying he can bomb anything, and the army is now uh, obsolete as well, and so the army said, we, we can't have that. So uh, they actually delayed the Army Air Service becoming the Army Air Corps in 1926 until after his trial was over, uh, because one of the first missions of the Army Air Corps was coastal defense. So he won, but they weren't going to let him have the victory while he was still in uniform. And then one last photo here for you, just because I, I know we, we've had uh, discussions about cockpits before. Uh, this is the interior of uh, one of the aircraft cockpits. That was interesting at the bottom half here, you can see the radio they got right above their knees on this here. So I don't know if anybody needed this interior cockpit view, but that's uh, what I had, and I think I made my time. So with that, I open up to your questions.